the normalization of Israel's annexation of the West Bank and the extremist elements behind it all. 1,000 cases and counting. Post-earthquake, Turkish courts are busy policing content online. And the precarious state of journalism in crisis-ridden Pakistan. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the new home of The Listening Post, where we don't cover the news, we cover the way the news is covered. When hundreds of Israeli settlers rampaged on the occupied West Bank last week, murdering a Palestinian and burning large parts of a village to the ground, that story made headlines, as did the killing of two Israeli settlers just hours before that, which triggered the revenge attack. What was absent from most international news coverage was a larger development three days earlier, when the Israeli government handed control of the West Bank from the military over to a civilian a right-wing minister, a settler, Betzalel Smotrich. Human rights activists, including Israeli ones, say that amounts to a de jure annexation of the West Bank. Annexation of Palestinian land has long been considered a red line the Israelis could not be allowed to cross. Yet in Europe and the U.S., political leaders and news outlets have failed to react accordingly. Two months into the most far-right government in Israel's history, Palestinians are seeing their rights evaporate, their homes taken from them, and they are left to wonder if anyone cares. News audiences numbed by years of imagery of the Israeli occupation, the settler violence, the theft of Palestinian land, should not mistake these images for more of the same. What they are seeing is unprecedented. A government that mixes the right-wing policies of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu with far-right elements in his cabinet, whose rhetoric and policies can be laced with outright fascism. We are used to seeing footage of settlers go coming off from the hilltops to the Palestinian lands and attacking people, attacking homes. Uh, throwing stones at, uh, at farmers and on residents of the villages. What is rather new is the, um, the extent of which the army is a, a, an active participant now. We used to describe this phenomena as uh, soldiers standing idly by, but now we are trying to come up with a new name because what we see is not standing idly by. Essentially, Israeli uh, soldiers and border police officers are confronting Palestinians with lethal force in situations where there is no justification for the use of lethal force. And then the Israeli mechanisms that supposedly pretend to be uh, examining these cases of Palestinians killed are simply whitewash mechanisms. They do not provide accountability. On the contrary, they provide impunity. So how did we get here? The current government is the most extreme in Israel's history and includes Jewish supremacist groups uh, like the Jewish Power Party and the religious Zionist uh, bloc. Elements that had been previously uh, been considered too extreme uh, even for uh, Israeli right-wingers. And they've now been normalized and, and brought into this ruling coalition. Elements like Itamar Ben-Gavir of the Jewish Power Party and Betzalel Smotrich of the religious Zionist party, who was born on a settlement and still lives there. Both are part of a Netanyahu government that just last week effectively annexed Palestinian land by stealth. It did so by transferring the authority over large sections of the West Bank from the Israeli military, an occupying force, to the government's civilian side. And it put Smotrich in charge of that territory. <laughs>
what looks like a mere bureaucratic change is in fact much more than that. It creates a completely different legal reality for any Palestinian on the West Bank who stands in Israel's way. Once you take these authorities from the military commander, laying them in the hands of uh, an Israeli minister, this means annexation. There is no longer legal framework operating uh, the West Bank in a kind of division between what is occupied territory and what is Israeli, the sovereign Israel. Once there is annexation, without any uh, rights to the Palestinian who lives in the West Bank, uh, but sovereign Israel is the decision maker for this uh, territory. Now we are talking about annexation and, of course, apartheid. Smotrich openly calls himself a fascist and he wants real demographic change on the ground by expelling Palestinians from Palestine, not just from the West Bank. Either you surrender to the occupation and live without rights in the home that we have not yet taken from you, or if you ask for basic civil rights, then we will expel you from Palestine. The way that uh, these extremist elements in the Israeli government uh, are being covered in the Israeli press spans the entire gamut. There are a handful on the left uh, in the Israeli media, like Haaretz, who are not afraid to call them out for what they are as insiders or even as terrorists. But the general trend ranges anywhere from uh, mild discomfort to tolerance to openly embracing uh, some of their views. That's just part of the, the process of, of normalizing them in, in Israeli politics. We contacted numerous Israeli government departments on the growing extremism there. None agreed to be interviewed. And this past week, Betzalel Smotrich gave the media more to talk about when he said this about a West Bank village that 7,000 Palestinians call home. <laughs> These comments were irresponsible, they were repugnant, they were disgusting. And then the U.S. State Department spokesman did what he does far too often. And just as we condemn Palestinian incitement to violence, he fed journalists an equivalence, a false one, on the occupier and the occupied. As though the Israeli crossing of a red line, its de facto annexation of Palestinian land, isn't what is driving this story. International news coverage has also failed to give these developments, which are historic, the coverage they deserve. Typically, news outlets take their cues from governments and suffer from the same shortcomings, succumbing to the same interests, the powerful pro-Israel lobby, fearing that more accurate, critical coverage will open their journalists up to charges of anti-Semitism. Israeli exceptionalism is the rule that too many of those outlets follow in the language they use and the terminology they carefully avoid. Why aren't uh, U.S. and Western media uh, more comfortable using terms like fascist and apartheid in relation to Israel's treatment of, uh, of Palestinians? There are lots of reasons. They're not accustomed to thinking of, uh, of Israel in those terms. Uh, they are much more accustomed to thinking of Israel in terms that Israelis view Israel. There's a default toward the Israeli perspective in European and in American uh, media in particular. So it's not surprising that certain things will get filtered out. It sometimes seems as though in Israel there is more press freedom than even in places like Europe. For example, the BBC interviewed me about the terrorizing of Palestinians and the current fascist government. The presenter told me clearly that I cannot call them fascist, even though Smotrich calls himself a fascist and the media in Israel calls him fascist. The international media censors and filters and uses terminology shaped by those who lobby them. I usually tell them, just cover the truth as it is, whether it is for us or against us. Ask yourself, in what other conflict is the word of the occupier and the terminology accepted over those of the occupied? 
certainly not Ukraine, where Russia's version of the story gets the scrutiny it deserves from the reporters covering the war. For Israel, the journalistic focus on Ukraine and the implicit nuclear threat there offers a welcome distraction, the kind Israeli forces have taken advantage of before. During the pandemic, the entire international community was locking down. Um, Israeli settlers were using that opportunity to expand their reach, to uh, use more and more violence against their Palestinian neighbors. So clearly, um, Israeli policymakers, the Israeli army, Israeli settlers are all very much aware uh, of the relevance of media and of the focus uh, or the, the importance of media reporting of the situation on the ground to the ability of Palestinians to resist the violation of their rights. It's been nearly a month now since the earthquake that killed more than 50,000 people across Turkey and Syria. And the clampdown continues on critical reporting and anything else the Turkish government deems problematic. Minakshi Ravi is here with more. Richard, the aggressiveness of the crackdown on unfavorable narratives since the quake has resulted in some eye-popping numbers. The Turkish Cybercrime Department has sent more than 1,000 people to court as a result of their social media posts, with more than 600 facing charges. Allegations include spreading fake news to cause alarm and panic and inciting hatred to cause enmity among people. One of the accused, Ahmed Erjan, is a professor of seismology with a sizable following. A tweet of his saying women in the quake zone were at risk of sexual assault led to his arrest. Media outlets have also been targeted. Last week, Hulk TV, Fox TV and Telebir were all fined by the country's broadcast regulator and Telebir was taken off the air for three days. Those channels have focused on the shortage of emergency supplies, critiquing President Erdogan and the ruling AK Party in the process. Now, it's clear that misinformation has been a problem. Fake stories include reports that the quake had caused a dam to burst and that Afghan and Syrian migrants were on looting and crime sprees. However, analysts say the government is silencing its critics by abusing a disinformation law passed late last year, which was already contentious. The upcoming presidential election in May was always going to be a challenge for President Erdogan, and the restrictions on what can get said are set to grow tighter. Thanks, Mina. The Pakistani government is facing trouble on multiple fronts. Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif is taking a pounding from an opposition led by his predecessor, Imran Khan. The economy is in a perilous state. The security challenges now include a resurgent Pakistani Taliban carrying out attacks across the country. For decades, the media have endured periods of military rule, intimidation from both militias and the security apparatus, as well as financial uncertainty. The way power is structured there, the incentives not to do the journalistic job can be greater than actually doing it. We conducted a survey of journalists in Pakistan on the most pressing issues they now face. Topping the list, extreme political polarization, the financial squeeze, and censorship. We hear from two of those journalists now who paint a picture of a news industry that is in part paralyzed. The PTI continues to hold protests against the ouster of Imran Khan's administration. The country is facing soaring inflation, dangerously low foreign exchange reserves. Recent events in Pakistan have put the spotlight squarely on the deteriorating security situation. Journalism in Pakistan is a struggle. You could lose your job, you're going to be asked to censor many of the stories that you did, and you could lose your life as well. Crisis, which is political or financial, is automatically affecting our media. I think that the journalists who are in the past, I think that the effect is the most important.
Every time there's been a political crisis in which two political parties have not been able to come together, there's been some kind of resolution or a common enemy. But in Pakistan's case at the moment, there's a dysfunctional parliament in which neither side is talking to each other, whether they're in opposition or in government. Media polarization to pichle chand ek saal mein is nej par pounch gai hai ke aapko ab mukammal ek divide nazar aata hai. To wo phir kehte hain ke main us nazariye ke saath hoon, to aap is nazariye ke saath hain, to mera sach jo hai, wo sach hai. आपका सच जो है वो झूठ है करो पॉलिटिकल एक्टिविज्म कौन नहीं कर रहा आजकल मैं मैं आपको नाम लेकर बता दूं आपको पता है कि कौन सा चैनल कौन सा जर्नलिस्ट कौन किस जगह पे खड़ा है वो किस साइड कौन सी लाइन ले रहा कौन सी लाइन तो हर एक का अपना एक सच बना दिया गया है जिसका नुकसान क्या हुआ यही पोलराइजेशन सहाफत सहाफत नहीं रही यू सी अ फ्यू चैनल्स दैट uh, cash in on the popularity of one leader or the other leader. There's been an interesting sort of media study that said that a lot of the viewership, so especially those that lean towards the Pakistan Tariq Saf, had lost interest in news channels uh, during his regime. Post April, when Imran Khan was ousted from power, ratings skyrocketed because people were interested in watching on a day-to-day -day basis what's going to happen next, what will um, Imran Khan say next. You have seen that in the past few years, you are only looking at the screen. वैसे तो होना ये चाहिए कि भाई आप सेहत तालीम पानी ना होना ये सारे इशू दे एक आम आदमी का मसला दे वो जिस किस्म के माशी क्राइसिस है वो बेरोजगारी हो रही है लेकिन हमारी स्क्रीनें जो हैं वो सत्तर फीसद से ज़्यादा आपको सियासत पे नज़र आती हैं मेरी स्टोरी वहाँ रह जाती है तो उनको लगता है कि ये स्टोरी चूँकि अभी बिकेगी नहीं अभी बिकेगा वो जो बात कर रहा है तो इसको खैर बाद में चला लेंगे और ये करते 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 रात के बारह बज जाते हैं फरजाना अली और आज एक बार फिर बात करूं। फिर कहीं जाकर सुबह के आठ बजे जब कुछ सारे सो रहे होते हैं तो उस वक्त फिर हमारी स्टोरियां जो है वो आती हैं media industry has been uh, in financial dire straits for a few years now so this is not new and it's partly because of the Pakistani economy um, it went into negative growth rate in 2019 about 3,000 media workers were laid off and many uh, salaries were cut as well you also saw a fall in advertising revenues most of the advertising is concentrated on the big five channels and uh, that means that uh, other media organizations that are not getting enough of the money have to really compete for attention. When you have a financial crunch, you will have to say that you 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 have to क्योंकि रेटिंग मीटर वैसे भी नहीं है देखें जहाँ अब एक शहर में कराची है उधर 255 रेटिंग मीटर लगे हुए हैं और पूरे खैबर पख्तनख्वा में आठ या दस रेटिंग मीटर लगे हुए हैं जो कि अब और भी कम आ गए हैं और बलूचिस्तान में पाँच छः लगे हुए हैं तो मालिक ने कहा कि मुझे क्या ज़रूरत है कि जिसकी मेरी रेटिंग ही नहीं आ रही और फिर आगे जाके मुझे एडवर्टीजमेंट ही नहीं मिल रहे तो मुझे उनकी आवाज़ों की क्या ज़रूरत है रेटिंग्स आर रियली डिटरमिंड बाय थ्री और फोर सिटीज़ विद इन पाकिस्तान दैट मींस दैट रूरल एरियाज स्मॉलर कम्युनिटीज डोंट गेट एज मच कवरेज for the last six months, there have been massive protests in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, in Sabat, for instance, which saw a lot of terrorism. Uh, and these massive protests got not as much coverage as the protests that uh, Pakistan Tehri Kainzaf and Imran Khan have held over the last uh, six months as well. The other example, it's actually tragic, which is how the floods were covered in Pakistan in August 2022. It took about two weeks for the Pakistani media to actually pick up on the story and how dire the situation was. And the origin of the story were a few social media posts where many people who were living in those flood-affected communities posted about uh, what they were going through, and it prompted the Pakistani news media to suddenly wake up. So the Pakistani news media's um, business models, the financial crunch, um, has meant that its interest in public interest journalism has really steadily fallen. There is control in someone's hands. 
और वो कंट्रोल वाला कह रहा है कि अगर आपने ये चलाया तो आपका लाइसेंस मअतल हो जाएगा आपकी एडवर्टीजमेंट काट दी जाएंगी आपको से नहीं मिलेगी आपके एंकर्स ग्राउंड कर दिए जाएंगे तो फिर जाहिर है हमारी बात कौन करेगा the censorship has come in the form of um, asking certain anchors or journalists to be laid off calls to suppress certain interviews um and also actually the, um, a, a kind of financial censorship as well which is um media organizations their circulation has been restricted because they made certain people unhappy aap jab khyber pakhtunkhwa ki baat karte hain to yahan pe kaam karne wale sahafiyon ko kai qisam ke masail ka samna karna padta hai sabse pehla masla to ye hai ki hamari zindagi daav par lagi hui hai aur wo isliye ki aap ek khaas siyasi jamaat ke khilaf bhi kuch nahi keh sakte aap mazhabi lihaz se bhi koi khabar nahi le de sakte kyunki mazhabi रिलीजियस प्रेशर ग्रुप इतने हावी हो गए हैं कि वो आपकी जान ले सकते हैं तीसरी बात ये होती है कि आप का जो दहशत गर्द हैं या आप कहें तालिबान कहें आप उनको अस्क्रियत पसंद कहें आप जो भी लफ्ज इस्तेमाल करें वो हम पे मुकम्मल नज़र रखे होते हैं आपने ज़रा इधर उधर से बात की और आप उसमें आ गए यू सीन लॉर ऑफ सेंसरशिप और मेनी जर्नलिस्ट हु टेल दर स्टोरीज ऑन मीन स्ट्रीम मीडिया they took to using youtube and digital channels and using social media assalam alaikum nadreen main hu asad ali tour apne program asad tour uncensored mein aur aaj aapko hum phir maujood hain ek missing person ke protest mein aapko pata hai mainstream media par to ye issue censor hota hai waise so you also have a lot of journalists who feel like they are committed to that free expression committed to telling as much of the truth as they can I think uh, the pakistani news media despite its difficulties despite its flaws and it's deeply flawed um it is also a story of partly of resistance mujhe lagta hai ki jo safar maine ek aurat hone ke naate shuru kiya tha ke cultural barrier the ek glass ceiling thi mujhe laga maine usko tod diya to maine bahut bada teer maar diya abhi aise andekhe glass hain jo hamare andar ya daire hain jo khinchte ja rahe hain aur khabar kahin dur hai And finally, big oil and the big lie. The climate crisis grows worse, energy prices are still high partly due to the war in Ukraine, and somehow oil and gas companies are sucking up more and more of your money. Last year, the five big oil giants generated a record 200 billion dollars in profits, that is twice as much money as was pumped into Ukraine in military and humanitarian assistance. Some carefully crafted messaging, greenwashing, designed to convince you those companies are leading us to a green energy future cannot hide their continued investment in fossil fuels so we're leaving you now with a satirical video from the american political cartoonist mark fiore who gets at the hypocrisy that is at the heart of big oil's business and propaganda model we'll see you next time here at the new home of the listening post war inflation climate change and unfathomable tremendous stupendous record profits which is a sign we're doing things right as we transition to renewable energy we're big oil and we're big on green we're not profiteering we're preparing for a clean energy future by providing the oil and gas we need today and if you're an investor watching this know that at least 95% of our capital expenditures are for extracting good old fashioned oil and gas we've got a good thing going and we're working to keep it that way so enjoy your healthy dividends fire up your gas furnace and know that when you're driving your luxurious suv we're thinking about a clean green energy future and pretending to plan for it